Hello, welcome to Understanding Earth. For our purposes in this course, the Earth and how it works, or Earth processes. I'm using a furnace piece here from the 6th edition. You will probably likely have a different edition. That's okay, they're pretty close. And we'll start out with uh, Chapter 1, The Earth System. This is Cohen, the soft-coated Irish Wheaton Terrier. You're going to be hearing from him uh, fairly often. I hope not as often as last semester, but uh, he's always lurking about. You can hear some foot stomping right now. So uh, don't be alarmed if you hear sudden wild, crazy sounds in the background. Now, chapter one, the Earth system is going to introduce you to how the Earth system works, what the Earth system is, how it behaves, and what's in it for us. Okay, I've cleared the sound booth of Kuhn. Some things to know about the Earth system. All parts of our planet and all the interactions of those parts comprise the Earth system. The Earth system is an open system. Geosystems include climate, plate tectonics, and the geodynamo. We'll discuss all of these things as the course progresses. So what we see happening here in this image is an impactor striking the Earth. It's traveling through the atmosphere, disturbing the thin layer of gas that surrounds the Earth. It's heating that atmosphere. It strikes the Earth, volatilizes solids and liquids, and those in turn enter the atmosphere. Ultimately combining this disruption with the biosphere results in potentially an extinction event. As we saw about 65 million years ago, an even greater extinction event around 250 million years ago, and a number of others prior to that. We're going to cover in this lecture the scientific method, geology as a science, the Earth's shape and surface, the discovery of a layered Earth, the Earth as a system of interacting components, and an overview of geologic time, a quick, brief overview of geologic time. First, we'll start out with the scientific method. The goal of the scientific method in this example is to explain how the universe works. Ultimately, it's the ultimate goal of the scientific method. If you understand the universe, you're going to understand everything in the universe. We start with observation and experimentation. We see something, we feel something, we notice something. We describe that as an observation. In order to make sense of that observation, we may do experiments. These experiments may include watching for that thing to happen again, or experimenting to generate that thing happening in a controlled environment, whatever that thing is. Development of a hypothesis or multiple hypotheses as tentative explanations for that thing that we observed. Testing or challenging an experimentation to eliminate hypotheses that don't work or revise them such that they work better. This brings us to scientific theory, a coherent set of hypotheses that explains some aspect of nature. And then a scientific model, which is going to be based on many hypotheses and theories. These are all hypotheses and theories that have successfully risen above challenges and have been verified via experimentation when at all possible. So here we have the scientific method laid out. We start out at the top with observations and sometimes chance, an accident, serendipity. You happen to be in nature and you may see a large block of ice fall into the water. That's an observation. Why did that happen? That is what we're going to test. So we come up with a hypothesis. Gravity pulled that ice towards the center of the Earth, thereby dropping it from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. We're going to challenge that hypothesis to see if other things could have caused that falling of the ice. Was it wind, maybe, that blew the ice into that other location? Was it water that pushed the ice into that other location? Things like that. So we're going to generate a hypothesis. Gravity has pulled that ice down the slope or over the edge 
and we need to test that. We're going to test that hypothesis by continuing to watch for the event to repeat itself, maybe set up an experiment under control conditions to mimic that observation. If that observation and the ideas are supported, we may elevate that to a theory. The theories are going to be treated like more advanced hypotheses. People will attack or test them. And if they survive those attacks, those tests, then it may become a scientific model. Now, there's no chart, no spreadsheet that you have to accomplish these things in the world of science. This is all generality about how science works. It's important to realize this process is ongoing for now and forever, we would hope. As we continue to accumulate information, we continue to build upon the hypotheses, the theories, and the scientific models. Conversely, new information may come to light that suggests maybe that idea isn't so good after all. It worked for a while, maybe it worked for a very long time, but now we see some flaws in the reasoning, and we're going to rethink our hypothesis, our theory, our scientific model, and adjust it so that it's more accurate. You can see that here in this engineering flowchart. We'll start out with an object. Does it move? No. Should it move? Yes, it should move. Use WD-40 to make it move. If it still doesn't move, Now, a real-life version of this relates to early observations of Mars. These are early astronomical observations after telescopes became somewhat sophisticated. Now, a scientist named Giovanni Schiaparelli in Italy, in Milan, observed in 1877 what he called canali. Now, canali in Italian can mean a canal, like it means in English, or it can mean a ditch, a digging, a gulch, a ravine, uh, any kind of lower excavated kind of structure on uh, a surface. Now, this excited the attention of a man named Percival Lowell. He was a wealthy guy from Boston. His family made money in the cotton uh, business or industry, whatever you may want to call it, in the 18. 60s, 1870s. So he had the money and the interest, mathematical skills, to build his own telescope, the Lowell Observatory, which is near Flagstaff, Arizona. Being a rich guy and having some nice toys, he experimented with this idea of canals on Mars. And he helped to advance the idea that these canals were constructed by Martians. Now, this was about oh, 140 years ago, not that long ago. There were very real concerns that Martians were actively changing the surface of Mars. This uh, terrified a lot of people, that there was some alien activity that could be observed from Earth. This occurred at a time when people were fascinated by aliens, as they are today as well. So, Lowell jumped in, and as a famous rich guy... He elaborated upon the ideas of Schiaparelli. Now, he never, as far as I know, never really thought that Martians were involved in this to any great degree, but um, he's tied into it nonetheless. What it turns out to be, as we develop better telescopes, is that there are no canals. What happened, if we just go back for a second, is the human eye tends to form lines, relationships between objects. So any dark spots, darker spots, on the surface of Mars, say from a mountain or a crater, natural features would be lined up in the imagination of the observer. At this time, there were no telescope cameras, so everything was tied to someone like Schiaparelli, and Lowell sitting and looking through a telescope for hours and hours, waiting for the atmosphere to settle down so that this image becomes less blurry. So they might have a second or just a few seconds of somewhat clearer surface viewing of this planet 
And then they would make some drawings, some quick sketches. And this is an example of one of those sketches that was made over probably a fairly considerable amount of time. But again, once we had better telescopes, we saw that there were no lines on the planet. There are no canals on the planet. So that hypothesis is rejected. Now, thought questions for the chapter. How does science differ from religion as a way to understand the world? It's believed by most people that cosmology was the first science. How did we get here? What's going on in the sky at night? Those kinds of questions were addressed in cosmology. They've been discussed by humans as long as we've had ways to communicate. And therefore, cosmology was the first science. And ultimately, it evolved into religion or a number of different religions. So religion requires belief in the statements that are made by that religion. Science tries to convince you that their statements are correct. Scientists try to convince you their statements are correct by proving that. So in a very basic way, religion requires belief and science requires understanding that can be used to generate a new belief. Now, if no theory can be proved true, why do almost all geologists believe strongly in Darwin's theory of evolution? Well, it's because people don't know what the word theory really means. The idea initially was a hypothesis that became a theory. This is back in the 1850s, 1860s. And now it's pretty much a scientific model. It's accepted by scientists. It's accepted by the general population for the most part to be how plants and animals got to be the way they are today. Now, if you were to see this, this is an image from Mexico from probably about uh, maybe half hour, 45 minutes from Tulum, and it's a cenote. If you didn't know anything about geology, which may be the case at this time, hopefully not three months from now, this would be kind of a magical, mysterious place. If you do believe in science and understand geology, it's still kind of a magical, mysterious place. But we understand what these things are. We understand how they got here. We understand the processes and the chemistry and the biology and the climatology and the hydrology behind all of this. For example, this is made of calcite. This is calcite. This is a tree root. These are tree roots. Now, we can go into this cave. Obviously, it's pretty convenient now. You can touch these things. You can look at them, and it's very clear that these are roots. These are very clearly calcite. How they formed and why they're here is other information that we can glean as biologists and geologists. So we can make sense of this in fairly short order. By the end of the semester, all those things I just mentioned here will all make sense. And this image will still be cool. You'll still want to go there, I hope, but it won't be entirely magic. It's going to be science that looks magical. When we talk about geology as a science, we have some major questions in geology that involve processes that operate on large scales and over long time periods. Field observations are supplemented by laboratory experiments. You go outside, you observe nature, and then you think about how to mimic that experience in a lab where you don't have other things going on that might influence the results. As a result, there are many subfields in geology, including oceanography, ecology, geophysics, geochemistry, and geobiology. Thus, geology isn't looking at rocks necessarily. In addition, there are others, including planetary science, where you make geological observations that rely on what we call remote sensing. We have a spectral analysis of the light coming from a planet that tells us what's on the planet's surface, for instance. A special aspect of geology is probing the Earth's long history. Geologists look back in time, and they look forward in time. This is something that a few other fields do. Biologists, of course, to study evolution. 
uh, how plants and animals got to be the way they are and where they think they may be going in the future is similar to geology. But geology really employs that aspect as, as one of the prime components of the science. What has happened over time, over very long periods of time. One of the principles that we consider to be most important in geology is the principle of uniformitarianism. This principle of uniformitarianism states that the present is the key to understanding the past. This is generally attributed to Charles Lyell, James Hutton. It's most likely a statement that was made originally by William Wewell. I won't spell that out for you. And uh, I challenge you to say it. William Wewell. William Wewell came up with this idea that you can look at what's going on in the world today and assume that's been going on in the past. Therefore, using what we see today can describe what had happened in the past, and hopefully at some point they would develop some means to determine how far back in the past that thing happened. Now, as an example here from Arizona, we have two processes, one that's occurring slowly and one that occurred very rapidly. When we look at these two images again, we're going to see that the rocks at the bottom of the Grand Canyon are about 2 billion years old. The most recent layer of sediment is about 250 million years old. That means whatever happened here happened between 250 million years ago and the present. When we look at this feature, which is not very far away, we see evidence for an explosive impact of a meteorite that created this crater in a few seconds. So you can't really see, now well, these are, you can see cars here for scale. You're not allowed to walk down here anymore, but you can have, take your picture next to the bottom of it with a fake photo up here in the, uh, the selfie area of the museum. So this is an event, this excavation, unlike this excavation, occurred very quickly. This took millions of years, probably around 50 to 70 million years. This took a second or so. Slow and fast.